Bruchem Aboyim. Welcome to our home. Thank you for attending. Um, tonight, on my thoughts, uh, I'd like to talk about a mountain, a field, and a tent. Again, I'd like to examine the three references that the Talmud states in connection with our forefathers. Again, Abraham, Abraham, Yitzchak, Isaac, and Yaakov, Jacob. The Talmud in the Tractate of Psachim states that when Abravino, Abraham our father, would offer up his prayers to God Almighty, he called it a mountain, as it states in the portion of Ayera, in connection with the Akedis, again, the binding of Yitzchak. Bahar Hashem Yerahe, on the mountain God will be seen. With Yitzchak Avinu, with Isaac our father, it states in the portion of Chayesura, that Vayetze Yitzchak Lasuach Basadeh, and Yitzchak went out to pray in the field. And then in connection with Yaakov, you know, Jacob, our father, it states, in the portion of Vayetze. Vayikra es shem hamokam ahu beis el. And that he called the name of the place, the house of God. So the question becomes, how are we to understand these three references? Avram Vino, Abraham, our father, was really a trailblazer. He climbed the mountain of God and was successful in bringing down godliness into this physical world. His final test was to take his son Yitzchak up the mountain of God and there to offer him up as a sacrifice to God Almighty. Abnavino Abraham, our father, dedicated his life to attempting to connect godliness, the spiritual, not just with heaven, but also with the earth. And so he dug three wells. Now, the number three in Judaism always signifies what we could call a chazaka, uh, a permanence. He attempted to forge a permanent bond between the spiritual and the physical, between heaven and between earth. We find many times in religious writings that water is associated with Torah. Water that comes from the earth is referred to as mayim chayim, living water. This is an allusion to the Torah, which brings life into this world. Abramavino, Abraham our father, dug three wells, but the Philistines, the Pelishtim, filled them all with earth. Now, he was successful in climbing the mountain, but he could not establish a firm hold of Torah and mitzvot, of godliness, on this earth. It was his son Yitzchak, Avinu, Isaac our father, who would redig these same three wells, only to have the Philistines successfully plug them up once again. But he, but he persevered. He never gave up. He maintained his total discipline. He dug a fourth well, and this well survived, as it states in the portion of Toldot. And he called this fourth well Sheva, meaning the seventh. So as to commemorate the occasion, he named the city Be'er Sheva, the seventh well, a name which still exists of a city in Israel today. Now the word Be'er uh, in Hebrew means a well. It is also an acronym for the words Be'adcha Afkid Ruchi, in your hand, meaning God, I place my spirit. An allusion to the fact that Yitzchak had succeeded in bringing down the Torah and godliness into this physical world. He was, as it states in the portion of Toldos. The verse there states, reads, Esav, Ish, that Esav was a man, Yodea, Sayed, a skilled trapper, Ish Sade, a man of the field. Well, somehow this verse seems to be referring to Esav, not to Yitzvah. Well, I interpret the verse just a little different than its simple meaning. I believe that this verse is telling us something about the wisdom of Yitzchak Avino's method of parenting, in addition to a great lesson in child rearing. So the verse begins, Esav Ish. Esav was a man. That tells us he was an adult. He was no longer a child. So Yitzchak, his father, dealt with him accordingly, as a man and not a child. The verse continues and states, Ish Yodea Tzayid, a man who was a skilled trapper. Again, I believe that these words are alluding to Yitzchak and not to Esau. It is Yitzchak, his father, who is referred to as an Ish Sada, a man of the field, as it states in the portion of Chayasara. 
Vayetzig Yitzchak Lasuach Basadeh. And Yitzchak went out to pray in the field. He was the chosen one, the one individual who was able to bring godliness down from the mountain that his father had climbed and connect it with this earth. Yitzchak was successful in connecting the Har, the mountain, to the Sada, to the field, permanently in this physical world. Yitzchak Avina was also successful in connecting with his wayward son, Esav. He tailored his criticism so that it would be received as a constructive tool to help his beloved son to grow spiritually. He attempted to persuade Esav to attain higher values than he would have otherwise pursued. Yitzhak Avino understood that his mission in this world was not to bring up his special son Yaakov. No, Yaakov Avino would have been Yaakov no matter who his parents were. As we read with the birth of Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses our teacher, in, in the beginning of the second chapter in the first portion in the book of Exodus, there it states that a man from the house of Levi went out and married Levi's daughter. Moshe's parents, both, sorry, Moshe's parents were both two, were two of the most illustrious individuals in Egypt, yet they are not mentioned by name. The question becomes, but why? to teach us that any two individuals have the ability and possibility to bring a special soul into this world. Yitzhak Avino understood that his mission in life was to break himself, to change his nature. So rather than displaying his character trait of gavura, severity, he chose to forge a relationship with his wayward son Asa, predicated on his father's traits of kindness and patience. So, instead of banishing Asa from his house, well, Yitzhak embraced him. Instead of yelling at him, he engaged him in conversation. Instead of dealing with him as the Rasha, as the evil son mentioned in the Pesach Haggadah, where there it suggests that the father should haka ashina, knock out his teeth. Instead, Yitzhak chose mm -hmm, to show Asa a smile. Yitzhak's unbridled kindness overcame his son's rebellious nature. So in a sense, they both grew. They both changed their nature. As the saying goes, more than we bring up our children, we bring up ourselves. Yitzhak Avinu understood that confronting an Asim directly would fail bitterly. And so he found other ways to influence his wayward son. We read in the Torah that Asim's first two wives were both from the family of Ham, the son whom Noah had cursed. In addition, both of Asaph's wives were idol worshippers. They were, they were, as the comment, the commentary say, that they attribute Yitzhak's blindness to the incense that Asaph's wives offered to their idols while they were in his home. Yitzhak realized that there was little that he could do or say about Asaph marrying his first two wives. He was deeply concerned that anything that he might say would drive away his son. And so, he said nothing. But somehow, Asaph did marry a third wife, and this time from the family of Shmuel. But why? When Yitzhak sent Yaakov to Lovin's house to find a wife, he mentioned that if Yaakov were to marry one of the local women, it would cause him great distress. Now, Yitzhak had waited until he was certain that Esav was in the room before he told these words to Yaakov. Somehow, when Esav heard what his father said to his younger brother, then he listened. If Yitzchak would have said these exact same words directly to Esav, he may not have heard a word. He may not have bothered to listen at all. You know, it happened that I had a similar situation occur in my life. At the time, my daughter was attending a secular public high school. It was just before the holiday of Sukkot. And she had invited over a Jewish friend who had no religious background whatsoever. And they were both helping me to put up my Sukkah. While we were working, I was doing my thing. <laughs> I was talking to a friend about the holiday, its history, its symbolism, and its laws. When her friend left, my daughter turned to me and said, You know, that was really great what you told my friend. I really enjoyed listening. 
Well, I began to laugh. I said to her, Beth, you know, you've heard everything I told her many times before. She nodded and she said, you know, but somehow it just sounded a little bit different when you told it to someone else. So Esau married Machalot, the daughter of Yishmael. The name is derived from the Hebrew word Mechila, which means forgiveness. From Esau we learn that when two people marry, all of their sins are forgiven. Now this is the reason given as to why a chasan and a kala, a bride and a groom fast on their wedding day, according to the Ashkenazi custom. The day is referred to as Yom Kippur Cotton, a minor day of atonement, again reflecting Yom Kippur, a special day when all of their sins are forgiven. So were all of Yitzchak's efforts in vain? The Torah still portrays Esau as an evil person. Well, that may be the case, but really let us examine the facts. The Talmud states that we learn about the mitzvah of kibbut HaVa'im, of honoring our parents from Esau. It is written in the Talmud that Esau showed so much respect for his father that he even changed into special clothing whenever he would minister to his father. Esau could have killed Yaakov after he stole his blessing. The only thing that prevented him from doing so was that he did not want to hurt his father. He said he would wait until after his elderly father's death and then he would take his revenge. However, when the time came that the two brothers reunited, after not seeing each other for a 36-year-old period, well, guess what? They hugged, they kissed, and they cried on each other's shoulders much like any two brothers who had not seen each other for such a long period of time. Well, Esau still sent his son Eliphaz to kill Yaakov on the road. Yaakov was able to convince Eliphaz to take all of his possessions in lieu of his life. We find stated in the Talmud that Ani Kames, that a poor man is as if he is dead. Eliphaz's compassion was the direct result of his being brought up on the knee of his grandfather Yitzchak. In addition, there are many great converts that have been gathered into the Jewish nation, such as Reb Meir, Rabbi Akiva, Unculus, and Ovadia, and many more giants who have contributed greatly to our nation and its history. Without their contributions, Judaism would not be what it is today, all descended from Esau and the efforts put in by his father, Yitzchak. Yaakov Avinu is connected with the concept of a tent, we read in the portion of Toldot that Yaakov was referred to as Ish Tam Yoshe Aholam, a perfect individual living in tents. We also read in the portion of Balak in the fourth book of the Torah, where Bilam blesses the Jewish nation with the words that we recite daily in our morning prayers. Ma tovu ohalacha Yaakov. How good are your tents, Yaakov. Yaakov Vina was able to incorporate both the traits of his grandfather and his father. He blended them, their kindness and discipline, into his unique trait of tiferet, beauty or truth. He was successful in integrating the spirituality that we glean from the mountain and the physicality that we glean from the earth. He was successful in uniting both together in his tent into one entity. He adapted both of these traits and allowed them to illuminate his private domain. Not only his residents, but also those who resided there with him, his family. He was the only one of the forefathers whose bed was complete, meaning that all of his twelve sons were righteous individuals, tzaddikim, worthy of becoming the progenitors of the twelve tribes of Israel. Yaakov viewed himself and his home as the word spoken by Bilaam the prophet, which we recite daily again in our morning blessings of Matovo Lecha Yaakov. How good are your tents, Yaakov, meaning a tent, a temporary dwelling. It was only God's house, the Temple Mount, that Yaakov referred to as Base El, a house in the portion of Ayetze, when he called the Temple Mount the house of God, a permanent dwelling. The house of God in this world is Mishkan Asafi Yisrael, the tabernacle, the true dwelling, the dear of Betachtonim, the house which the Jewish nation built for God Almighty in this physical world. Now, each of our forefathers introduced one of our three daily prayers. 
Abraham Avinu, Abraham our father, the morning prayer, the Shacharit. Yitzhak Avinu, Isaac our father, the afternoon prayer, the Mincha. And Yaakov Avinu, Jacob our father, the evening prayer, the Ma'ariv. The prayer that is that they the prayer that they instituted is an indication of just who each of them were and what they were able to accomplish in their lifetimes. Abnovino, Abraham our father introduced the morning prayer. The Hebrew word for morning is boker, a time of revelation. The morning is a time when we dismiss the darkness of the night and introduce the light of the dawn. The prayer that we recite is called Shacharit which has within it the Hebrew word shachar, which means black. So Avnavina with his prayer was able to eliminate the darkness of the night and reveal a godly light with the dawn of godliness into this physical world, which he had acquired while on the mountain of God. Yaakov Avinu introduced the, pardon me, Yitzchak Avinu, introduced the afternoon prayer, the mincha. The prayer is recited in the afternoon. The Hebrew word for afternoon is Taharayim, a time of light and revelation. We can find the Hebrew word for oil, Yitzhor, within this word. Oil also maintains the ability to illuminate its surroundings. The word Mincha is connected to the Hebrew word Menucha, which means rest. Yitzhak was successful in bringing down to the earth the godliness that his father, Abn Rabinu, had revealed. It was he who brought it to rest permanently, on Hasadeh, on this earth. Yaakov Avinu introduced the evening prayer, the Ma'ariv. The Hebrew word for evening is Erev. This word can also mean to combine, form a new entity. Yaakov Avinu succeeded in combining the trait of Chesed, kindness, which defined his grandfather, and the trait of Gvura, severity, which defined his father and created something completely new and different, the trait of Tiferet, beauty or truth. He was able to blend the spirituality which his grandfather had brought down from the mountain, together with the physicality that his father had produced from laboring in the field, and gather them both together into his tent, his home, his residence, so that he would be able to share them with his family and create a dira betaktonu, a permanent home where the divinity of God, our Father, truly resides in this world. Our nation began its journey in the desert living in tents. In order for an individual to reach the greatest heights of spirituality, they must first place their feet firmly on the ground, and only then will they be able to reach to the heavenly throne above. The Aquavino understood that everything in this world is temporary, a tent. Most everything in creation is subjected to the ravages of time. The exception to this rule is Torah and Mitzvot. They are eternal. They exist both in this world and the next. They are timeless. God's house began as a tent, a portable domicile, something that can be taken anywhere. And so too Torah and Mitzvot are not limited to any time or place. But one must recognize that a tent is a temporary dwelling. Our mission in this world is to establish God and his house as a permanent dwelling everywhere within this physical world. So, let us lift up our eyes to the mountain and let us place our feet firmly on the earth. And together let us pray that we can usher in a period when God's house will once again reside on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem permanently with the coming of Mashiach Sukkano quickly in our time. Again, let me thank you for attending. I hope that you found the lecture interesting and informative. Um, normally, we would continue uh, with a little break. With uh, I've started a music rendition of the 25-plus songs that I've uh, had the merit of being able to uh, originate and to play, to make up. Um, but we are now in what's called the three-week period a uh, three-week period that uh, commemorates the destruction of both temples in Jerusalem. And um, it began with the fast of the uh, 17th of Thomas, which was last Thursday. And again, for the next three weeks, we do not play live music, so I will not be playing. And hopefully, we'll continue again three weeks from now. Just as a quick no knowledge for yourself, there were five things that started on this on the 17th of Thomas. That's what Moshe 
Moses broke the two tablets. First time he came up down from the mountain. Second time he was more careful. And uh, the second thing that was done was the um, this the huh, interesting. So it was the breaking of the tablets. The Pastumus put a uh, a, a, a idol in the temple. He also burned a Sefer Torah. And uh, cute. That's why I write everything down. The um, Oh, they, the destruction on the during the first temple, they stopped sending up the sheep of the Korban Tumit, which was their protection, and that brought about the destruction. And in the second temple, um, the uh, city was, the, the walls were surrounded again on the 17th of Thomas. So again, all of this, in the end, lead us to what we call the 9th of Av. Now, both temples were destroyed on the 9th of Av, again, which is the end of the three weeks. So again, just a quick overview. I'm sorry for the uh, hesitation on remembering stuff, but um, hopefully you'll look in and study with someone to get more knowledge on it. But again, thank you very much for attending. Let me wish you again, you should be happy, you should be healthy, you should be safe. God should bless you with all that is good, and Shabbat Shalom. Again, thank you for attending. God bless.